Monday, August 22nd. It's the call up. As always, I'm your host, Arm Layton, joined by Jack McMullen. Jack, we've got a lot of guys who are on fire right now through the minor leagues, and I'm really excited to highlight some of these players, including the young brothers. That's Josh and Jace. We're going to talk about them. Jordan Walker continues to just go nuclear. Also, Two arms in the Philly system who got promoted and could not have started better in double A in Mick Abel and Andy Painter. A lot of fun stuff to discuss today. Yes, a lot of fun stuff. Uh, many fires, much fire, very hot. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, there, there's a lot of good stuff happening around minor league baseball right now, um, which is great because, you know, often I feel like we're talking about the guys that were top flight that are struggling mightily. It's fun to mention um, the top guys that are actually performing to the expectations that are already sky high. And we talk about breakouts a lot. Um, you know, we'll talk about a guy like Kerry Carpenter who, who figured out the swing and that carried him all the way to the big leagues a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it, it's a guy like Jordan Walker, who we knew was already really good. And now he's turning the page to really, really good. Uh, that is a very fun development for us as prospect heads. Yeah, and, and especially while somewhat navigating some new positions, right? We've seen him make four starts in center, Jordan Walker. That is seven starts in right and a pair of starts in left. Uh, I talked about it on a couple episodes prior about just kind of why the Cardinals are doing that. And it's really a testament to just how close he is to the big leagues now. And uh, he's going to get to the big leagues well before Nolan Arenado's days will be numbered at the hot corner or even Paul Goldschmidt's at first. So they had to figure something out here and it is for Jordan Walker to get acclimated to the outfield. And the guy turned 20 years old three months ago uh, on the day today. So, I mean, he's still extremely young, but a sneaky good athlete for a 6'5", 225 pound guy. I really think he could settle in to a corner. It's been a little bit rocky. I talked about that a couple episodes ago, which is normal. I think he's going to get his reads. He's got a 70 grade arm. He is an above average runner. He should be fine in terms of getting acclimated to the outfield, but it really hasn't impacted his offense whatsoever. And we're continuing to see Jordan Walker. Just, it seems like every time I check the box scores, he's either homering or has a, a multi-hit game. And this is a dude that started the season as a 19 year old in double A. So one of the youngest guys at the level and might see triple by the end of the season, Jack, the last 20 games for the Cardinals top prospect, 347, 414, 707 slash line. That's an 1120 OPS, a 173 WRC plus. Oh yeah, he's also only striking out 18% of the time while walking at a 9% clip. I mean, what more could you want from this guy while he's trying to learn a new position? It's just really amazing. Yeah, so I, I think that often we make things incredibly complex. I, I think that we make this game a little bit more complex than uh, many do. And for Walker, I honestly think the game has gotten a little bit simpler for him. Um, I think that he is getting acclimated to professional baseball life. This is his second full season of minor league baseball. He spent last year in low A and high A. Um, obviously, as an 18-year-old in low and high A, 19-year-old in low and high A, it is you know, welcome to adulthood, kid. Let's see what you got here. Double is, you know, again, a different story. It's a step up here, but he was obviously very comfortable already at third. Now he's hopping in a corner outfield spot. Naturally, corner outfield spots are way easier to play than yeah. third base. So yeah. like he can take that moment to say, okay, I'm going to go grab a fly ball every now and again. Um, you know, I, but he doesn't really have to think that much about that. It's not like learning shortstop. No, learning right field is exponentially easier than learning shortstop. And he's got more time to focus on his offense with that. I'm pretty surprised they've given him four starts in center too. And I, I think he's athletic enough to, to get by if he can yeah, learn why? the reads and routes, but I don't really get why I yeah. think right field is really the spot for him with that arm. And, you know, with, with the athleticism, he can be an above average defender there. The the reads definitely need some work, but like, who cares? Get those reads now in double, maybe triple if they want to move him up at, at that point. But I'm um, really excited. The bat is why they're doing this. And He's had three multi-homer games in his last 20 games. So right. this is a guy that is just kind of unlocked another level with the power. Uh, and, and really, we haven't seen the contact come at any expense. What's interesting is he is swinging a lot. Uh, his chase rates are you know kind of higher than average, but he makes so much contact and his damage is just 
there in terms of what he does to fastballs does not really struggle with breaking balls. Like you you'd think for a young, big, powerful hitter, uh, this guy is really darn good. And I'm interested to see how he continues to adjust to, you know, more advanced pitching. I'd like to see him get a taste of triple a at some point this year, but if the defensive, uh, I guess adjustments and learning a new position kind of leads them to maybe wait a bit. We could see that, but as we know, the Cardinals have been really aggressive with guys and I'm interested to see how Jordan Walker handles a triple a environment where you're not as likely to see the fastballs. You're not as, as likely to see the predictable pitches as guys have come on the show and told us, you know, at the triple a level, how does he adjust there as a very aggressive hitter? That's pretty much my only question for this guy at this point. I'm not that worried about, adjusting to to the outfield i'm not worried about you know the power and, and a lot of the things that we're seeing it's just how quickly can he get to the big leagues and what's that learning curve going to look like with how aggressive he is right now that's pretty much my only question with his swing profile is there a certain pitch or pitcher identity that that you're worried he will struggle with like O'Neill Cruz, you know, watching a whole bunch of O'Neill knew he was going to struggle with lefties as opposed to righties and lefty lefty matchups. It makes sense because he can't really handle breaking balls. And we see it up at the major league level right now. O'Neill, I think, is hitting like 110 against yeah. breaking pitches. Oh, it's not even competitive. Yeah, but but that's drastic. Like yeah. with the way Jordan Walker handles the bat, is there a certain pitch profile that might get to him, do you think? I don't think so, honestly, man. I really just think it's it's just the approach. Like this guy is such a good hitter that he's got that classic young case of I can hit anything, and he he almost can. Uh, but I just think he just pulls the trigger a lot. I, I don't know if there's really a pitch that you know eats him up. I don't know if there's really a struggle with pitch recognition. Uh, he he's crushed sliders this year. Uh, I I really think it's more so just learning to maybe not have to pull the trigger all the time, especially on fastballs. He's swinging it. I think 60% of fastballs this year and he's crushing them. But at the same time, like you get to triple a pitchers will prey on that. They'll kind of figure out how to use that against you. If you're extremely aggressive. And uh, that's probably the one thing that he needs to learn. And it just, it hasn't been a problem yet. So, you know, what, what are you going to tell Jordan Walker? Hey man, I know you're, you're hitting eight home runs in your last 20 games and hitting like 350, but stop you got to swing less. Yeah, stop swinging yeah. so much. So until it's a problem, it's it's not a problem. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll see kind of how that continues to develop for him. But again, that's just kind of the natural learning curve. And I'm very – that's why I want to see him in triple at some point to yeah. kind of just see how that, how that translates because there's guys that just are able to get away with that because the quality of contact and the frequency of contact. And I think Jordan Walker could easily be one of those guys, but he could also rein the approach in a little bit. A guy that's really kind of improved the approach and now has parlayed that into a big league debut, Jack, is Drew Waters. And Drew Waters was a former top 100 prospect, no matter who you asked, just about two years ago. And you know, probably even found himself on some lists as recent as last year. Atlanta Braves, early draft pick, super talented in terms of a switch hitter, plus speed, plus raw power to dream on, but never really tapped into it game-wise because of high ground ball rates and you know just a lot of swing and miss. Uh, but Waters gets dealt over to the Royals as part of a package to get that compensation pick that the Braves really wanted. And for the Royals, I, I liked the move, right? I mean, you, you go get an arm in Kaufman that I think could be a piece for them. They also get Waters, who you know is is worth a shot with the change of scenery. And that change of scenery has really worked. 940 OPS for him since going over to AAA Omaha, where we know it's hitter friendly there. And I think you can speak to that a little bit. But I don't really care where, where it is because this was somebody that was hitting 690 or had an OPS of 698 in 49 games in AAA Gwinnett and then now turns around and bumps that by 250 points. Uh, and really, the, the power ticks up seven homers in 31 games, 13 for 13 on stolen bases, strikeout rate drops, clearly something connected for Drew Waters in the change of scenery. Now he's going to get a chance to, to try it out at the highest level. Yeah, I hit her park or not, uh, 305 OBP in Gwinnett, 399 yeah. OBP in Omaha. Like that is, that's new life injected into Drew Waters. And Waters ahead of last year, he and Pache were top 50 prospects in Major League Baseball. And they were the future of the Atlanta Braves outfield. And now you're looking at Michael Harris and you're looking at Vaughn Grissom as guys that totally passed up. Waters and Pache. Pache is not there. Waters is not there. But I think Waters knew that he kind of had his last crack at being a legitimate prospect. That's really stressful. When he gets traded, you know, that, that could be disappointing for a moment, 
But then you get to a new environment where yeah. you have the opportunity to grow stress free. Yeah. It's like, okay, shit already hit the fan over there. I get a new lease on my baseball life. And I think with that new lease on his baseball life, he was playing with a lot more freedom. And I think he was playing more comfortably. And that in turn has led him to the spot that he's been grinding for his entire life. And that's major league baseball. Guys will always play their best baseball when they're not stressed about something. Absolutely. And, and I think there was a lot of pressing there for Drew Waters, who you talk about getting lapped by Michael Harris, and that's nothing to be ashamed about. He lapped everybody. Uh, but but you look at the 40 man situation and that's kind of why I think the Braves opted to make the move is, is Drew Waters would have had to be protected in the rule five. We know almost any team would have taken a shot on Drew Waters, given his athleticism and upside. Uh, yeah. So the Braves said, hey, why don't we get a draft pick for him now and, and try to make something happen now? I think when you get moved out here now and you don't have to sweat the 40 man spot as much anymore, you don't have to press as much. I don't think Drew Waters was trying to do as much in Omaha. And even if it's a little bit more hitter friendly, you can point towards the chase rates dropping. I searched from, you know, July 12th, which was when he was dealt on his chase rate dropped by more than 5%, which sounds nominal. That's a big difference. If you can cut that chase rate down from 30%, which is higher than average to 25%, that can make a big difference, especially when you're a guy that has the impact ability that Drew Waters has. He also cut down the ground ball rate, lifting the ball a bit more. The exit velos are above average. So now that he's able to hit the ball in the air a bit more, we're seeing more power in zone whiff has improved. So it seems like he's just made himself a more complete hitter. And I know the Braves are better when it comes to prospect development overall, but the Kansas City Royals have done a pretty good job with their hitters. Over the last couple of years, I, I would say so, right? When you look at the Bobby Witts tapping into what we were expecting them to be or the Vinny Pascantino is kind of emerging out of nowhere or the MJ Melendez is and Nick Prados who went from bad to they overhaul the development system and now really good and big league pieces. The Royals clearly have figured something out when it comes to helping unlock their hitters. Uh, so maybe just Drew Waters getting a new set of eyes, new ideology, and just a new approach to what he is doing Maybe that's all he needed, and a new set of eyes could have gave him one little tweak, one little thing, and that could be all that matters. So it could be the mental side. It could be both. Whatever it is, I'm very interested by what Drew Waters is doing. It's a 31-game sample, but I'm interested. I think there could be a big leaguer here if he can continue to parlay this success into you know something that is sustainable. And he's got an opportunity this afternoon to prove it. Like That's the beauty of the Royals situation. I love the point that you just brought up with – a lot of their prospects, like, do you call it development? Because it, it hasn't necessarily happened from low A to triple. But as these guys got to the upper levels of the minor leagues, they were in double A Northwest Arkansas. They were in triple A Omaha. They started to really click. I mean, last year, three of the top four home run getters in all the minor league baseball play at least half the season with the Omaha Storm Chasers in Witt, Melendez, and Prado. Um, the other one, your guy, Griffin Conine. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, it's like, Th that's the thing this staff in Omaha has not only seen Bobby Witt come through but they've also seen Melendez come through and they al have also seen Vinny come through and they've also seen Prado come through and they've also seen Kyle Isbell come through when you see that many guys with that much talent and you're handed another talented guy you can pluck what you have dissected from other people and play it in that guy how about Michael Waters, Massey? I'm sure, what? And How about Ma Michael Massey? Massey as well. Michael Massey is another guy that is pumped up. So like Waters, his swing may have some things that are similar to that of Massey or that of Pasquantino or that of Prado. When you see this many talented guys, when these guys are clicking at this level, those people that are there in hopes of molding the future of the Kansas City Royals can help dissect and improve Drew Waters. And it feels like they did in a month. A hundred percent. And I think there's something that happened there without a doubt. And also just credit to Drew Waters for, for sticking with it, because I know it can be probably pretty frustrating sub 700 OPS and triple you get traded. Uh, it's a lot of mental anguish to, to kind of push through and uh, really excited for him to make that big league debut. One last point on the Royals before we get to, you know, Josh and Jace young Gavin cross their first round pick this year, ninth overall uh, in the 2022 draft outfielder from Virginia tech who, I really, really liked this kid. And I thought the Marlins might take a crack at him, uh, given that they needed an outfielder that could really swing it. They end up going with Jacob Berry, and Gavin Cross goes a couple picks later. Cross has been spectacular in, in low A so far this season. 
four home runs through his first 10 games. He's got an OPS over a thousand, probably going to get the bump up to high A pretty soon. Cross was somebody that had some swing and miss concerns, and, and I don't think we've seen too much swing and miss in the early going. So I'm excited to see how he continues to, to develop against high A pitching. But Gavin Cross is off to as good of a start. Again, another really exciting Royals bat in this system. They've got a lot of dudes that can swing it. They've got enough bats. Let's get more pitchers. And then the Royals might actually have postseason aspirations at some point. Now they're just exciting. Very excited to see what they do this offseason, honestly, because I think they're going to attack the arms market. Like, I think they're going to find ways to piece it together. Uh, and, and I do think that they're kind of focused on contending in the next couple of years. I, I, I'm very intrigued to see what they do uh, oh, this offseason and beyond well, in, in terms of pitching. And Brady Singer has looked good. Daniel Lynch has looked competent. Uh, th- there's a little bit of life kind of starting to trickle in. I know Jackson Coar had a decent start in AAA yesterday. Uh, so there's some hope some glimmers of hope on the pitching side of things. But after that, it's tough because Mazzucato's so far away. Oh, yeah. And Kuderna, right? He's so far away. So far away. Yeah. So, it, and, and they went with another bat. I think they went best player available, uh, but, you know, and they didn't really get an injection of of pitching talent uh, through this most recent draft. But but they got it with Beck Way, who put together a very start, a very good start. And then Sakema and Chandler Champlain, like, they tried three okay arms for Ben and and way has put together some decent outings. Yeah. Way has been good for them. Uh, four starts, three, four, ADRA opponent batting average under 200 and has kind of kept the whip in check. This, this guy could quickly be one of their better pitching prospects as he continues to climb. And we've talked about it. Way was obviously the best arm in that deal. And uh, he's been pretty darn good uh, so far, really this whole season. And I think he should probably get the bump up to double a pretty soon too, as well. I think so. So, Someone that just returned from injury and you know, we weren't sure if he was going to be out for the season is Josh Young messed up that left shoulder, got the labral repair done. Fortunately, wasn't the throwing arm and you know that lead shoulder in his swing. Sometimes guys come back and they just don't totally feel right. That's not the case with Josh Young. He probably could not have started much better uh, since returning from injury. He was in the complex for eight games, which was pretty much like batting practice for him. He launched three home runs in eight games there. Then he goes to triple a where he's been even better five home runs in 10 games in triple. So that's eight homers in 18 games, but let's just focus on what he's done in triple a where he's hitting 390, 444, 878. And I want to emphasize Josh young was one of the best hitters in the minors last year, right? Between double and triple a, Hit for average, hit for power. I mean, hit almost, what was it, 320, 330. Got on base at a near 400 clip and launched 19 homers. Struck out only 22% of the time. And then now he he returns and pretty much is doing the same thing he did last year, but better. This guy coming off of injury to do what he is doing is spectacular. And, you know, really the only reason why I would have been hesitant to put him in the top 20 was because of the injury. Clearly, that's behind us, and I think we can look at Josh Young as a top 20, top 25 prospect in baseball at this point. Easily, easily a top 25 prospect in baseball with how freaking good the bat is. Um, I, I think Texas needs to be very, very encouraged with where they're at offensively. Um, obviously, you need Lighter and Kumar and, and guys like that to work out, but offensively, I think they're in a, they're in a great spot. I mean, the powers has just been there right away, too. Like That's what I was worried about. How does it look? How is he going to be impeded uh, swing-wise? And I was just happy to see him back and just to be able to get some live ABs and you know, get get maybe 150 plate appearances under his belt before the season's over. And instead, he's tearing it up. And now we're talking, hey, maybe he gets a big league call-up by the end of the year. I, I don't know. Again, we talk about with the new rules of, of how you can be compensated with a pick. It works to have guys in your lineup on opening day. Uh, you'll get rewarded like that, but you know, might lessen the September call up candidates. Uh, so I don't know. The Rangers don't seem to care too much about that. And they're very evidently want to win. Now they cleaned house development wise. And uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to build for the future and to win in, in the shorter term. And Josh Young's probably going to be their opening day, third baseman. Uh, that that's the guy who should be their opening day guy at the hot corner. He already had a home run this year, dude, 110 miles an hour, 440 feet. Um, 30 home run pop, great bat to ball skills and a good approach. This is safe of an offensive profile as you're going to find. And, uh, 
I, that's the third baseman, right? You got to figure out what you're going to do with Ezekiel Duran and the other guys, but I, I just don't know how much better of a start Josh Young could have come off of the IL with. You, you think Duran can move to a corner outfield spot? I think Duran can move almost anywhere, which is the good part. So I'm very interested to see how they decide to to navigate that. And what's confusing is Leody Tavares has been playing pretty well. I'm not sold on it, but they've been excited enough to put Tavares in center and, and off you know, offset Adolis Garcia to a corner. Duran could probably play center. He could also play a corner. He could also play second, but that's obviously where Semyon's playing. So they've right. got some decisions to make. Um, and I think in the shorter term, Duran will probably anchor a corner outfield spot. Uh, but I- I'd kind of like to see him. I don't know. I- I'd like to see him in the infield, but I- wh- where does he really fit at this point? It's, it's tough. I'm not sure because nothing should get in the way of Josh Young. And the beauty for baseball fans is there's two of them. Mm-hmm. Jace Young, I mean, the brother, he gets selected. What I thought was kind of later than I was expecting. I, we had an Armok him going top 10, and yeah. he ends up falling a little bit. And I think the Texas Rangers were, were pretty happy to be able to get him, you know, where they got him. This guy's kind of just a carbon copy of his brother. Uh, it, with, maybe, with maybe a little bit more upside. I mean, Jace Young could not have been uh, – I, I think he could have started a little bit better, but I still really like the bat and he has received a pretty aggressive assignment. They sent him straight to high A. Yeah. Detroit did. And uh, you know, I think that's pretty crazy to send your, your first rounder to high A, but we've seen that, right? We've seen guys sent straight to double. Uh, we've seen really aggressive assignments all over and um, Jace is struggling a little bit with it, but I really like what I've seen bat wise. And I think he's going to start to settle in over the next week or so. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Jace Young being in Detroit is kind of exactly what Detroit needs because we talked about the young pitching stable and all that. Um, now, I, I think you can discredit some of that offensive appeal that we thought they had. And a lot of guys that seemed like they were going to be around for three, four years going into this year, um, get them out of the lineup, dear God. Yeah. <laughs> right. That That's kind of what the Tigers have turned into. Uh, and and Jace Young was a great pick for Detroit at 12, we thought. This was a guy that hit 335 with an OPS well over 1,000 this past year at Texas Tech. He's struggling a lot right now in terms of impacting the baseball. He's striking out a little bit, not too much, but it's certainly noticeable. He's walking a lot. I think it's 11 walks and 63 plate appearances. So, I mean, that's it's a great clip that he's walking at in the early goings. Um, but you you got to see more power from Jace yeah. Young. And he had 14 pumps this year. What's funny is his, his brother had the same kind of questions in the early going. You look at the early parts of Josh Young's professional career, we were really questioning how much impact would be there. Um, and he was able to tap into more power, lift more. And all of a sudden now we, we don't really have any concern about the power for, for, for Josh Young. What's interesting is Jace is actually posting – better exit velos out of college uh, and and probably boasts more power upside in the early going. Uh, but it's kind of having the same problem in terms of tapping into it. And I said, I think in the beginning, I said Rangers, of course, that's Josh. Jace was selected 12th overall by the Tigers. And I think this was one of the higher floor bats. And I'm not really going to put too much concern into the start. His brother started slow. Josh starts a little, or Jay starts a little bit slow. I think he's going to get going. But again, it was a pretty aggressive si- assignment given the Marlins sent Jacob Berry to low A. Uh, Gavin Cross selected in the same range, sent to low A. And it shows you how confident they were in his bat. Um, but, you know, this is this is definitely a little bit of struggles in the early going, but nothing that I think you should be concerned about as a Tigers fan. Yeah, so the only thing I'm going to push back on you on is uh, I, for one, am in the business of the atomic takeaway three weeks into a guy's professional career. Oh, yeah? So I think he's probably ruined and they should release him and the White Sox should pick him up. Yeah, the, White, the White Sox should pick him up and throw him straight at shortstop, right? Correct. Because yes. <laughs> that's the thing too. Second base power guy. I like the profile. It's it's a He could be one of the best offensive second basemen in baseball if, if yeah. it all comes together. And I think it will. I really think it will. And I think that's where he's going to call home his second. Uh, so excited to see how he continues to develop, but uh, could be similar to his brother. I think a little bit more swing and miss and a little bit more power is the profile, but MLB pipeline just put out, you know, this was our first time having brothers in the top 100. Super cool. We'll have brothers in our top 100 as well. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty awesome thing for the, for the young family. Yes. hundred uh, percent. Are the Acuna's making it Luis Angel and, uh, and Brian? 
Brian, no. It, it, <laughs> maybe eventually. Uh, Luis Angel is probably going to make it. That guy has been spectacular in the Rangers org as well. Just another really good bat. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll rely on one list of brothers. But when Brian turns into Ronnie Jr., <laughs> Ronnie, the th- uh, he's not the third because that's Ronnie's kid. When he turns into Ronnie Jr., Jr. Jr., Jr., it's funny. I told you I, I pulled that Brian Acuna Bowman Chrome Auto out of like 199. And just because yeah. it's Acuna, it was one of the more expensive cards I've sold in a while. I sold it immediately. I'm like, this guy might not play stateside for like three more years. I will happily sell this card. And <laughs> I pulled it, sold it almost immediately. Uh, but it just kind of shows you how much how much money goes into these speculative names uh, right. there. And if your last name's Acuna, uh, people are going to want your card. Hey, speaking of cards, um, I saw your eBay segment that you did last week was on Colton Kowser. Yeah. Who's been just exceptional. I, I mean, dude, there's been few players better than Colton Kowser right now in double A. We talk about what Jordan Walker has been doing. Kowser has not been far off. I mean, in his 43 games at the double A level, nine homers, 327, 464, 556 slash line. I mean, he's walking 17% of the time, punching out 25% of the time. He's also playing center field. Like This is a really interesting profile. I think the strikeouts will continue to dwindle too. I think right now he's he's trying to impact a bit more. He struggled a bit with lefties, but Kowser is 22 years old. Uh, safe plus hit tool. And now we're seeing the power really start to, to come together for a guy that's not that big and has more room to add muscle. Kowser is one of my favorite prospects out there. And what's crazy is I gave him out on the eBay segment because his Bowman Chrome Auto is less than $100. And if you're looking at players with his profile, like if I'm looking at cards on eBay, a Bowman Chrome Auto for under $100 for a guy that's putting up some of the best numbers in AA right now in an up-and-coming organization that I think is going to be competitive for the next half decade at the very least, uh, that's a card I'm scooping up on eBay right now, no problem. Yes, 100%. I mean, Kowser... Honestly, Kowser has been one of my favorite guys to keep tabs on a, because he's funny as hell. Um, I've got a buddy that works for Masson and I, I showed you this. Uh, I think I, I texted it to you. Um, the, the tweet that, uh, my buddy put out, it was a snippet of the interview that he was doing with Kowser, And obviously the front half of it was all about baseball. And then at the tail end, he said, I got to ask, how's the Lego millennium Falcon going? Because Kowser is a big Lego guy. He loves building Legos. Um, and he's a big Star Wars person. And he said that he hadn't touched it recently, but then he asked to follow up, you know, um, so I, I take it because you're too busy to deal with the Lego Millennium Falcon. You have not gotten the Lego Star Wars video game. He said, oh, no, I have. <laughs> so this guy is kind of cut from the Joey Weimer cloth yes. where they want nothing to do with baseball when they leave the ballpark and they want to go put together the Lego Millennium Falcon or in Weimer's case, uh, play Minecraft and watch Family Guy, which is awesome. I that's that's big big boost in the top prospect rankings when you have that kind of uh, mental ability. And it's funny you mentioned Weimer uh, before we talk about the the two arms with Andy Painter and Mick Abel. I want to talk about one more eBay purchase too, and it's not Weimer. He still doesn't have a card, but his teammate, who we also interviewed uh, in that same episode, Sal Freelick, what he's been doing in AAA is 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 comical, Jack. And you know the reason why I was a bit maybe skeptical and in, in pumping a ton of money into to Sal Freelick cards is just how, what's his ceiling? You know, how many people are going to be collecting table setting top of the order hitters that may hit 10 home runs uh, as, as a, a card? You know, I think that's a fair question to ask, but when you can get Sal Freelick's Bowman Chrome auto on eBay for less than $70 and the guy is hitting 446 through his first 17 triple a games as a, as a 22 year old, I, I'm kind of in like, I, I'll, I'll buy those cards because if he's putting up, you know, batting title type numbers at the big league level, then people will still want that card. Um, and I, I think that we're getting to a point here where Sal Frelick needs to be a buy on eBay when you can get his card for $61 his Bowman Chrome auto. And the dude is just basically a walking multi hit game. Jack, hey, if you look at, the last 20 games, he has had more multi-hit games than not. I'm fairly positive, including several three-hit games and four-hit games uh, and a million two-hit games. He's figured something out at the plate, and if he starts to trickle in just even a little bit of impact, this guy is going to be a problem for a while. Can we acknowledge that Sal Freelich is fourth in all of full-season minor league baseball in batting average? He's hitting 334. 
in and 90 again, games, he's hitting 334. And that was after a slow start. He was not good when we saw him, right? He was working out some kinks when we talked to him. Uh, yeah. He didn't seem overly concerned, but the numbers weren't great. So, I mean, to, for what he's done since then, and again, like emphasizing triple A, to hit 446 through your first 17 triple A games is absurd. Uh, he had to five homers and double. It's a little bit of a launch pad there in Biloxi. Uh, so I'm interested to see, you know, how many home runs he can hit in, in, in double Nashville. or in triple, excuse me. But yeah. six extra base hits in those 17 games is more than enough. Um, and I mean, this, this guy's starting to look like one of the safest prospects in baseball and also a really exciting one as well. Yeah, I think so. And like, you know, when you hear small, um, you know, like, like Freelix build, you know, you think, oh, he's going to be like Quan, right? Where, where he hits 300, but he's slugging 300. Um, that's not Quan's MO right now. Like Quan hits it for a bit more impact than that. Quan is like a, a 410, 420 slug guy. I think uh, that's what Sal, he can be. Yeah. Sal's 480 this yeah. year. Yeah. And I think that's kind of Quan was probably in the 480 range in the minors. So I, I think Freelick and Quan are going to have a lot of similarities there. Freelick probably faster. Um, that and and more athletic, a little bit more explosive. Guy played football, was a really good football player as well. Uh, so I think there's a little bit more upside because of the the natural gifts that Freelick has. But I think it's a very good comp in terms of what you can expect from these two guys. And the Brewers really need a Stephen Kwan. Uh, they really need a guy like that. And I think if we're talking about highest likelihood to to anchor an outfield spot out of all the prospects in the Brewers system, including Asturi Ruiz next year, I think South Freelick's got to be number one, I think, on the highest likelihood to break camp and and kind of control a spot in the outfield. Who do you think is more likely to slot into an everyday role for the Milwaukee Brewers next year in the outfield, Ruiz or Freelick? That's basically what I just said. Yeah, is 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 Freelick? I, I think Freelick and w- with the consistency that he brings, I think that's the guy that's most likely to to break camp and and be the everyday guy there uh, in, in the outfield for them. I just think there's more consistency. I think he brings a little bit more to the game for them and a left-handed bat who can spray it all over. I I, I think Freelick's the guy that's going to break camp. Yeah. Do you think Ruiz is like a bench bat? I don't I, he's so tough to read, man. I think I think they're hoping he can be an everyday guy. Um, but again, I think I have more confidence in Freelick and his defensive ability in center. Maybe Ruiz is a corner guy, maybe he's a super utility. You know, you're hoping he can turn into almost a, a Chris Taylor type with some impact speed and steal some bags, play all over. Uh, we've seen him play second base at points too. Uh I, I can't he's a really tough guy to peg for me. He's impossible to peg for me. I've got no idea what a stereo Ruiz is going to be. But I want to talk about the last, the last thing I want to talk about here is the two pitchers. Oh and, yeah. And we talk about not really investing in pitcher cards, but I, I'm going to talk about why I'm going to buy Andrew Painter baseball cards. Um, and, and I think we're starting to see more money get pumped into pitcher cards. Uh, so I think part of it is just the fact that Tommy John surgery is just not really that much of a problem anymore. Uh, and also just pitchers are really fun to watch. And we have pitching ninja and things like that, that just really glorify how cool uh, the, the, just the pitching world can be. Um, but Andrew Painter's cards are starting to skyrocket and it's because he's starting to enter that like wonderkin type of, of territory, right? Like the, the Yuri Perez wonderkin territory. Uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone is as much of a freak as Yuri, given that, He's a little bit younger and has already pitched this entire season in double A. But Andrew Painter is very similar, right? 19 years old, six foot seven, has no business throwing as many strikes as he does. Nasty, high spin, high velo fastball. And I would say that Painter's wipeout pitch is already further along than any of, of the secondaries Three. that Perez has. But the difference is that Perez has more control of his third pitch, more command of the third pitch. Or as for Painter, it's more fastball slider he attacks you with. He'll mix in the curveball. Change up is kind of nascent at this point. But, man, I mean, Painter is not that far off. I'd say he's a, he's easily top three or four pitching prospect in this game at this point. G-Rod one. Yuri two. Yeah. Painter three. I think that's unless I'm just spacing on someone. Shane Boz, I pretty much want to graduate at this point. Um, I think Painter could easily be three. 
And I mean, we're, we're talking about a dude again that has no business repeating his mechanics the way he does. Uh, the fastball has stupid life and opponents are OPSing 581 against it this year. The slider has been a joke. Opponents are OPSing 373 and he mixes in the curveball as his third pitch. No one's really hit that pitch well either. Uh, he gives you the three speeds. If he even has an average changeup, a four pitch mix like that, he's starting to answer G Rod territory. Yeah, I think he is too. Um, two other guys, Kyle Harrison. Is Harrison above Painter? No. At, I, no. at this point, I think I'm taking Painter because Harrison comes with, I love Kyle Harrison. And again, another really young guy, but it, it's hard to argue against what Painter's done. I mean, he is the walk rates are a third of what we're, we're seeing, or not a third, but significantly less from what we're seeing, maybe half them from what we're seeing of Kyle Harrison. And yeah. again, I mean, striking out 40% of batters hasn't blinked since his debut in double the fastball Harrison. That's what he dominates with, but also he has the ability to throw in a slider and a changeup. painter throws in the slider and the curveball. all are disgusting. And painters already touched one Oh one this year. I like that. That's the craziest part. He's touching one Oh one hitting triple digits routinely averaging nearly 97 miles per hour on the fastball. And I think there's more in the tank. This dude is quickly becoming one of the nastiest pitchers in baseball. 126 strikeouts against 23 walks. I can't emphasize enough how mind-blowing it is that he is not walking dudes because he is so big, but his mechanics are pretty sound, and it's just effortless velo, man. It just explodes out of his hand. I'm not sure if you've ever walked through his numbers. Like, We'll just give you an updated look at all of his numbers. Uh, he started 18 games. He's got a 1.11 ERA in 81 and a third innings. Uh, opponents are hitting 157 against him. 126 punch outs, 23 walks, 45 hits in 81 and a third games. It's a joke. He's given it's up two joke. home runs. Two home runs this year. And I, the only other guy I would try to float at you that might be a better pitching prospect than Painter that we haven't mentioned is Espino, but Daniel Espino has been out the entire year. So exactly. I have no idea how you want to stack that. Yeah, if Espino was healthy, I mean, that's a guy that we were extremely bullish on right before the season. I was saying, I mean, kind of the same thing about him is maybe three guys I, I'd take over him if that. Um, and, and I think Espino is still in that conversation, but you don't pitch and other guys dominate. They're going to naturally push their way past you. No right. way an indictment on Espino. But when Painter's looking as good as anybody as a 19 year old and Espino's on the shelf with a knee thing, you know, I. I think you got to really look at Painter and say, maybe he's past him at this point. It doesn't mean that he's for sure going to be a better pitcher than him, but if I'm picking one guy that I want right now, and that's kind of how I think about it when I really am stuck on who do I like more, who are you taking? If you could, you know, you're starting your franchise, you need a pitching prospect. Are you taking Painter? Or are you taking Espino? Before I would say because of Espino's ability to pitch, you know, at higher levels than we've seen from Painter that I would lean towards him, but we just saw Painter dominate high A, and now we just saw him not even blink in his first double A start. It, it, that that argument's kind of out of the way now here. Yeah, six scoreless, eight punch outs, no walks in his double A debut. Espino, I, I don't want people to forget that Daniel Espino struck out 35 and walked four in yeah. 18 and a third innings this year. I mean, yeah. video game for him. Uh, but I'm with you, man. I think it's Painter with, with the age and with the maturity – and with the shocking uh, command that he has, I think it's probably Painter over Espino. Absolutely. And like, what is he going to look like in a year or two? I, it's it's unbelievable. And and I do think he's going to develop the changeup. I really he think might get beefy. He <laughs> might squat a lot. <laughs> Who knows, man? What's crazy is I talked about buying his card on eBay right now. I, I'm kind of floored. We talk about how pitchers are, are not somebody you want to spend too much on. I think he was more of a shorter print in 2020. Uh, the Bowman draft kind of set there one of his bowman chrome autos ungraded just sold for 256 dollars on ebay that's insane uh, so i'm not buying that <laughs> but uh that's just also a testament to how excited i think some people are getting about andrew painter um psa 9 on ebay right now just sold for 291 dollars bowman chrome auto again for andrew painter so um if you pull it I don't maybe maybe you sell. I don't know. Like, well, this is at this price point, people are betting on him to be the number one pitching prospect in baseball by by next year. I, I think that's pretty much what that price point reflects. 
So do you think this is worth something? I, I think we've talked about this before. This is a Panini Prism Andrew Painter like draft card. This yeah, is people don't like Panini uniform. People don't like Panini because you don't have the the Phillies. You know, you don't have the the team the team uni. But what's yeah, crazy but- is like Mick Abel is Bowman Cromada is going for forty one dollars. Isn't this isn't this cooler though? Cavalry Christian High School Andrew Painter. Like, you know that's my my rival high school, right? He was a South Florida kid. Yeah. Oh yeah. Calvary Christian. That is a, that is cool. Yeah. That, so they were in our district. We played, I obviously never played him. He's way younger than me, but we played Calvary Christian. They were really freaking good, man. <laughs> they, uh, they recruited a lot of guys. They had some dudes, um, but yeah, Calvary Christian low key powerhouse. Um, they would do the, the Bible verses between innings and then just beat the crap out of you. Um, Damn. yeah. So okay. Andrew Painter was like not even throwing that many innings for them. Like it threw in spurts. And that's why I was really shocked at how quick he's developed. Like they were not even really starting him every day. Like they, he was someone that kind of would go in relief at times. I was, I didn't love the pick when it happened. I'll be honest. Like I really didn't. I was, I was surprised. Uh, but I mean, they, they've got some dudes uh, and Calvary Christian high school continues to churn out some, some really good talent, but that is a cool card. I think Panini cards are underrated. I would scoop some up on eBay for the guys that are like too expensive Bowman Chrome wise, but uh, yeah. Mick Abel, I mean, at $41, that's probably a guy I'm scooping up more than the Andrew Painter. And I think, I think Mick Abel is not nearly as, as talented as Andrew Painter. Again, not an indictment on Mick Abel, but sneakily two years older <laughs> than Andrew Painter, which is hilarious. Cause I also feel like Mick Abel is a child, six, five, 195 pounds, not quite as dominant in high a as I thought, um, but still really solid. The walks were a little bit higher than you'd like to see them. Uh, but still struck out guys in bunches, did not give up a ton of loud contact. And I think it was enough to get that bump up to double. And that first outing for him in double was was really solid. Six innings, four hits, two earned runs, one walk, uh, and eight Ks. You, you couldn't really ask for much more from uh, their 2020 first rounder in, in Mick Abel. Yeah, I, I, Mick is what, right under a four ERA on the year? Um, he is, yeah, I believe after that last start, he would put him right under a four, right under a four. What do you feel like? So he, he feels like a fastball slider guy to me. I know he's got two different shapes of the breaking ball. Um, but when, when I watch Mick Abel, I'm like, he might be a little two pitch pitcher E, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, he's similar to painter in the regard that like the change up is way behind and it's fastball, slider, and then a curveball. And the difference is with Painter, I don't think they blend as much, right? Like, so the slider and the curveball are very distinct. Like, you, the slider is horizontal and sharp. The curveball is a banger. Whereas yeah. with Abel, they seem to blend a little bit. They're only like they're, they're both kind of hybrids of each other. Yes, yeah. Which is a problem in, in a way because a hitter is really only thinking about two speeds and two like kind of movement profile shapes. Whereas with Painter, like you're really thinking about three different pitches. You're thinking of a hundred up. You're thinking of a hard slider that can back leg you, which in his first double A start, that was like all he was throwing, which was manipulating the slider and just throwing slider, slider, slider. And then every once in a while would mix in the downer curve, which is nasty to lefties. Abel, it, it kind of blends in. And when it looks like the slider lefties have had a little bit more comfort against him this year, where they've just been a little bit better overall. But if he can mix in again, an average change up, he's going to be a really solid middle of the rotation starter, maybe even a number two, just turn 21. Uh, but I'd rather see him focus more on the change than the curve uh, because he just doesn't have that caliber of stuff like Painter does. But that being said, fastball is still easily a plus pitch borderline plus plus and the breaking ball. Uh, that slider is, is, is also, you know, a borderline plus offering as well. Yeah. I, I just think it's funny. Like, You've got Wheeler and Nola as the one, two right now. And far and away, your one, two in the system betters anybody's one, two in minor league baseball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what, what do you think? Uh, when do you think we could see these guys? End of next year. I don't think that's crazy. Yeah. I don't think that's crazy at all. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about what? So guys that by the end of this season will have. Five starts in Five, double six starts in double A. Presume that they are successful. I say Probably maybe start next year, next year they both in double. start in double. Start yeah. in double, quick jump to triple. 
could see them by the end of next year if they continue to do what what they're doing. As soon as they show consistent success, they should be up each spot. Yeah, like that's my thing with pitchers too. And, and we talk about you know pitchers. You may only have a certain number of bullets. Um, with pitcher, if you are really successful in high A for five starts, go to double. Yep. If you are very successful in double A for five starts, go to triple. That's and I thought. think I think we kind of saw that. You know, I, with Abel, it was a little bit different because drafted in twenty and then first no, with- chance in. The two guys we're seeing it with right now, sorry to cut you off, but the two guys we're seeing it with right now are are Painter and Ricky Tiedemann. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because, I mean, Painter was like, okay, 2021, just really kind of threw at the complex for a couple innings, and that was it. 2022, this season, dominates low A. After 38 innings, they said, hey, let's, let's go to high A. Eight starts there, 36 innings, dominates there. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get you to double. And I, I love that approach now. Like, let's not just waste bullets with these young pitchers because if they're showing things, get them to the big leagues as fast as you can. And I think we're seeing a lot more aggression in that regard. And I'm here for it. Uh, And I think we're even seeing it with hitters too. The talent pool is getting so vast that I think you can feel really good about performance in high A, double A and and how that's going to translate. You know, I think just the ringer is more intense and it makes it a little bit easier to make your judgment calls on who's big league ready and who's not, because it's just harder. It's just harder nowadays. And I think that makes it easier on teams overall. And and I think it sucks for the players. It sucks for like the bottom of the barrel players in major league baseball. But I think baseball could really benefit from closer to an NBA level shelf life, where if you're not good for the first three years, you got to figure out a place to stay. Like you, you run out of chances. I feel like baseball, you get a lot of chances and there's too much talent in this sport. Now in the minor league games that we watch, for guys to continue to get chances when they're not deserving of them at the major league level. And we're seeing teams so much more willing to, to, to try out those youngsters. And I think the Braves are really proving it, Yes. but you look at like the the Orioles, do you want to roll out a Brett Phillips or like give Kyle Stowers a chance out there and, um, and get more reps in the corner. Uh, Or how about Beatty? Yeah. Brett Beatty, you know, you want to continue to roll out, you know, whoever you're going to replace, uh, Luis Guillorme with or give Beatty an opportunity. I know he's kind of struggled over the last couple of games. They've thrown him against just crazy arms, yeah. but give Beatty that opportunity because he might be able to, you might be able to ride the hot hand there. And clearly he's been, you know, showing some flashes there. Um, we're going to be doing a live stream later tonight. This is an afternoon episode on Monday. We're going to put out the top 10 Reds prospects in the midseason update, which I'm extremely excited about because they have really uh, reinvigorated that system. We're going to be live on our YouTube again, Monday. So today, the 22nd, if you're listening to this podcast, the afternoon that it came out, if you missed it, go check it out on our YouTube. I'm going to be answering basically all questions from Reds fans tonight at at 9 PM, excuse me. And just breaking down why we made the top 10, what it is, because it's really interesting uh, with all the talent there. And then a lot of other names that are going to be kind of in the fold there as prospects to watch and what has now become one of baseball's five best farm systems without a doubt uh that should be fun so come hang out with us on that youtube stream later tonight or come check it out if you missed it uh and and see some of the questions and answers we have but we're going to do an episode also on that top 10 probably either this week or or moving forward next week at some point wait nothing more here a couple more interviews on the horizon uh, to look out for prospect wise. I hope you enjoyed the Casey Schmidt interview uh, from the last episode. He has been mashing in double a since we talked and uh, extremely talented guy over there. Really nice dude. Uh, so go check that out. That'll do it for this episode. Check out all the prospect content at just baseball.com. A bunch of other stuff over there as well. Continuing to work on the uh, mid season update for the top 100, obviously writing up the red system helped knock out probably five dudes in the top 100. So uh, that was nice to get out of the way first waiting for basically the front end stuff to be done on the website uh, to update basically all the functionality and things, which is kind of in its final testing stages. So uh, people will really enjoy uh, the new list and the way people will be able to navigate it. So looking forward to that. As always, thank you for listening. If you could take a second to leave a rating, help grow the show, would really appreciate it. Share it with your prospect friends who are also as nerdy as we are. That'll do it for this episode. We'll talk to you on Wednesday.